Uh, great to be here today. I said, I'm Marina. I used to be the Chief Technology Officer of the VA, and these days I am a crisis engineer at a partnership called Layer Aleph. Hi, everyone. Uh, Nick Sinai. Um, I'm with Insight Partners, a large venture capital and private equity firm, and actually do uh, a lot of national security investing these days. I spent almost six years in the Obama administration and was the U.S. Deputy Chief Technology Officer. So we wrote a book called Hack Your Bureaucracy. It's 56 tactics for uh, getting things done in some of the world's worst bureaucracies. If you uh, are familiar with Frank Sinatra's song, My Way, he sings, you know, if I can make it here in New York, I can make it anywhere. And our premise is, if these bureaucracy hacks worked in the White House, the VA, and the Department of Defense, they're going to work anywhere. Uh, and so we want to share a few stories with you today. Uh, the first tactic I'd love to talk about is using the bureaucracy against itself. So Nick and I have had the great privilege of working with some of the best technical talent in the country, first through the Presidential Innovation Fellows, which is how Nick tricked me into coming into the government, uh, and then by creating the United States Digital Service. Uh, and a really consistent theme was often that some of this top talent in the country or in the world would come in and believe that their mission was to blow up the bureaucracy. The bureaucracy was something to go around, to avoid, to escape, uh, and that's, that's not how Nick and I believe that it works, and that's not how we've seen people be successful at getting things done in large bureaucracies, or bureaucracies of any size. Uh, bureaucracies change all the time, if you think about it. People's pay bans change, strategic plans change, leadership changes, and if you can learn the natural rhythms of your bureaucracy, you can actually change it in a way that uh, makes the least risky, highest reward path for everyone else to do the thing that you want them to do. You know, so, we, okay. we called the book, you know, hack, it, hack Your Bureaucracy, but that's two almost negative words. People think hack as a, as sometimes as a, a pejorative, and I certainly hear bureaucracy, you know, being slinged around these last couple of days as a negative. Uh, but we see hack as a clever way to do something, not only to advance your code into production, to ship your product, to, to get a policy launched, what initiative launched, but also to make those systemic changes. So it's not just your thing, but it's how do you make the organization better off? And from a bureaucracy perspective, uh, we see it very much as a neutral term. That is, if, if you read a little bit about bureaucracies, which we did uh, prior to writing this book, uh, it's very much about hierarchy, officialdom, wisdom, but also constant process, right? And so bureaucracies uh, exist in all size organizations. In, in both public and private sector. And it's fundamentally about a standard way for organizations to bring their expertise and have a consistent experience for consumers, customers, stakeholders. And so we tried to find bureaucracies uh, or places that weren't a bureaucracy. Yeah, it took us to like a co-op grocery store in Berkeley, California. Spoiler alert, still a bureaucracy. Uh, so a big request I would get constantly when I have new hires coming in at the VA was, what if we just get a waiver for the bureaucracy? What if, you know, Secretary Bob or President Obama writes a little memo that says, like, FAR and FedRAMP and all those things, they don't apply to us. We're going to have a waiver. Um, and that doesn't work. And I know that doesn't work because this is a picture of me with President Obama giving me this waiver. Uh, this is a cabinet meeting for the VA. A cabinet meeting is not a place that chief technology officers are supposed to be. I was there because he was really mad at me for not having gotten an ATO in nine months at that point. I don't know that he was quite sure what an ATO was, but nine months seemed like a really long time, and I was in a lot of trouble. And I had rehearsed this explanation of risk and incentive frameworks, and I was gonna be like, but then, then there's this ISA MOU that I just have to sign, and I just need this one person in Texas to do it, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and he heard me and said, you know, I wanna help. How about I record a video on YouTube that tells everybody that they have to give you this approval. And you guys are all familiar with that page of FedRAMP where it says, like, did the President of the United States say on YouTube that you don't have to do this? And then you click yes, <laughs> and then you're, you get your FedRAMP certification at the printer and you mose, mosey on along. Uh, so firsthand experience does not work. Uh, what actually works is using the bureaucracy against itself, figuring out what were the forms, the policies, the procedures that would get me through to my ATO. Uh, there were about a million of them on this particular process, but a couple examples. One was our inspector general told us that we could not use cloud computing, which we believed was important so that our website didn't have like business hours. Uh, but they said we couldn't do that because you couldn't put the cloud in an evidence bag. And so uh, we 
got, you know, the first thing is like to be mad and like, God, they're so stupid and like, grr. And instead, we had lunch with them every day for two years uh, and got to understand more about what their process was. And their business process was when they had to do an investigation, they would walk into someone's office, they would pick up the server, they would put it in an evidence bag, they would walk out. They could not imagine how they were going to do that if the server was somewhere that they could not touch. Uh, I cheekily made cloud-shaped sugar cookies, put them in evidence bags, and handed them out at the office holiday party. Uh, that somehow did not convince them either. Uh, but what did was showing them how they could do their investigations better without having to literally do heavy lifting, right? You can use CloudTrail from the comfort of your home office if you want even, and do investigations even more easily and readily. Uh, and to this day, the highlight of my career is the day that the Inspector General wrote a memo saying that they preferred logical access over physical access for conducting their investigations. But to Brian's point yesterday about like sharing the real stories, that took two and a half years. Uh, there were also questions on the forum like, did I, Marina, jiggle the doorknob of Amazon Web Services to make sure that it was locked? Uh, I tried answering that a lot of ways. I was like, metaphorically, I did jiggle the doorknob sort of by doing these other things. Uh, and it kept, I tried not applicable. I tried leaving it blank. It kept getting kicked back, kicked back, kicked back. And finally, it occurred to me, maybe I should understand where the form comes from. And it turns out the form itself was overseen by like four people who, when I went to talk to them, were like, oh, we can change that. We'll just remove that question entirely for the cloud. And when you have that kind of power in a bureaucracy, you might want to change a couple other questions on the form. So then when I was changing it anyway, it was like, hey, does your thing have business hours? Mm, can't pass go anymore. Uh, is your server in a mop closet underneath a fire sprinkler with no backup, as a hypothetical example? Uh, maybe you shouldn't be able to move forward uh, in this approval process. And so when we changed those forms, um, as many of you who are working with the VA today now know, like we have ATOs and a continuous ATO, which is like absolutely mind boggling to me from, from back then. So look for ways to use the bureaucracy against itself, change the forms, change the policies, change the practice guides, whatever it may be, so that the easiest thing for people is to sign that ATO paperwork and not to fight you over jiggling doorknobs. Can I just say one thing before we move on? Is we start this, we start a book with a story because this is such a, a powerful epiphany that the leader of the free world, the commander in chief, is offering to record a video to encourage uh, employees in the VA to uh, approve a process. And it's Marina's epiphany that President Obama, as thoughtful and powerful as he may be, could not fix the VA. It was up to her and all of her colleagues and the existing employees of the VA to make that change. And so it's, it's that message of no one else is coming to save you. The President of the United States cannot save you. It really was up to Marina and her colleagues. Yeah. Uh, pilot is the password. I think uh, at Perdacity, you probably have to take a shot every time we talk Kessel Run. Um, but I, I did uh, include the story of, of Byron, Brian and um, Enrique and, and Adam and team um, in, in the book. Uh, and the Kessel Run story is very much of a pilot, you know, uh, not pilot in the Air Force sense, but a pilot in terms of, hey, instead of trying to reimagine the entire AOC, you know, let's do this little tanker refueling app and let's get that live and let's show the Air Force that this is a new way. Uh, and th so this is a, a super powerful tactic that we're big fans of, regardless of whether you are in policy, in product, in software development, uh, wherever you are. And oftentimes, it is just starting with a spreadsheet, right? Just getting people collaborating, because oftentimes, uh, organizations have these 10-year plans. There's some new capability that will be in acquisition. We're going to do this new thing. Uh, I mean, that was, that was part of the story of, of the uh, AOC was, you know, this was a multi-year kind of traditional system, and, and yet it, it, there was a, a, a way to uh, start small and build momentum. And there was a great post on LinkedIn the other day about this idea of quick wins versus small wins, but long-term focus. And I think, you know, having a small pilot that actually shows progress, that shows people what you're talking about, and then, and then gets some, some additional momentum for that long-term win. Uh, third story I love to share is find your paperclip. So also in the spirit of transparency, when I started at the VA as chief technology officer, you might have think that I had some kind of 
responsibility or money or resources of any kind. Um, but I showed up and was told my job description was to redefine the art of the possible for how America honors and serves its veterans. I had a zero dollar budget. I had zero headcount. Uh, nobody would invite me to their meetings because I had just been auditing the VA's use of technology from the White House for the last six months, which made me very popular. Uh, I tried to buy a dry erase board for my office and was told that my $99 annual office supply budget was insufficient to buy a $105 GSA dry erase board. And if I brought one from home, I would be in violation of OSHA and probably some other things, so I couldn't do that either. Uh, so I'm sitting at my desk alone. No one will talk to me. I have literally nothing except a pile of paper clips. And it reminded me of this story that some of you may have heard about this blogger named Kyle who took a literal red paper clip and through a succession of barters, traded it for a house that he subsequently lived in. So I am staring at my pile of paper clips, thinking like, ooh, can I trade this for literally anything? When uh, the head of the executive secretary pool popped her head in my office and said, hey, Marina, have you seen Green Pack 42? And I said, I don't know what that is, but I have nothing else to do, so I will come help you look for it. So we wandered around, for any of you that had been at VA headquarters, this 12-story, fairly wide office building looking for a Green Pack 42. And all a green pack is is a green file folder with the number 42 written on the front. And when other agencies or members of Congress would write an official letter to the VA, our official response would circulate through clearance in the building in this green folder. And it quickly became apparent to me that all the executive secretary team ever did was wander around the building looking for green folders. Uh, this being the VA, on the eighth floor, uh, while looking in a closet, I found a box of barcode scanners and thought, ooh, what if I printed a barcode on the front of these folders so that people could check them into their desks and execsec would always know who had the folder last. So I wrote like the world's smallest Ruby on Rails app that Friday, uh, printed some barcodes and, and presented it to them, th not really thinking a lot of it besides trying to find some way to be useful. Um, and then suddenly you heard this boop happening all around the building as people were checking in their folders. I called it Folder Finder because I like alliteration. My maiden name is Marina Martin, so I was alliterative at the time. Uh, but they called it M Boop, M for Marina and Boop for the sound that it made when people were checking in their folders. Uh, and I had unwittingly just unlocked this huge pile of political capital with some of the most important people in any agency, which is the executive secretary pool. Uh, fast forward a couple of months, there was this thing called healthcare.gov. You probably all heard about it. Went super well. Uh, <laughs> Guess who was slated to, to launch the next federal website after healthcare.gov? It was the VA, which at the time, for those of you that are around the public sector a little bit, the VA, we were trusted to do nothing. We were only on the front page of the newspaper for like horrible things just consistently every day. We were constantly in trouble. We just, we weren't trusted to do anything. And so we were gonna launch the first website after healthcare.gov. And the White House was like, hell no, you are not. Uh, and there was a room of people that were trying to performance test this new website. It was called the GI Bill Comparison Tool, and it would let a veteran enter their military service and figure out how many dollars of um, higher education benefits they would be eligible for depending on which chapter they picked. And if you pick the quote unquote wrong chapter, you're out tens of thousands of dollars that you can't ever get back. So it's pretty high stakes. Uh, and so they, they learned from healthcare.gov that maybe you should load test things, which is good. They load tested it, and it crashed at eight users. Not great. Uh, and you know who's in that room was someone from the executive secretary pool who said, hmm, Marina can print barcodes. Maybe she can save this tool. I don't know. So she came to me, I came to them, and I kind of looked at it. It was basically a calculator. It didn't require any personal information. It didn't require a login. It had been crazily over-engineered on servers and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, all right, I could put this on GitHub Pages, which is free, uh, because the office of the CIO, which where Nick had been, had published some written documents on GitHub Pages. So I was like, oh, OMB already uses this tool, so it's definitely approved. Uh, and also it's free, because I remember, I have no money and no resources at all. And so myself and a couple of Presidential Innovation Fellows rewrote the tool over a weekend in the most basic JavaScript on the planet, put it on GitHub pages. They tried performance testing GitHub pages. That didn't go so well because it crashed the performance testing computer. Uh, and the White House, I had to swear on my non-existent firstborn that it would, it would be fine if it launched. President Obama announced it. It did not crash. And now the VA had like, whoa, we had a win for the first time ever. Uh, and I was able to 
funnel that a little bit forward into some more political capital by uh, launching what is now VA.gov, for those of you that are at the VA. But at the time, again, I couldn't have my own, I couldn't take over VA.gov. There were too many people with vested interests. I had to buy vets.gov and have a separate site over here. Uh, I had, at that point, I learned you could have a purchase card. So I had $2,999, which meant I was like, oh, I could buy Heroku, a little bit of Heroku for a website. Um, and I filled out the paperwork there and asked how I knew it would scale. And I said, because Heroku hosted the official Miley Cyrus fan club, uh, which was approved, I will say. So sometimes, you know, give it a shot on the answer. Uh, so fast forward a bunch of paperclip trades. When I left the VA, I had a team of 75. I had many millions of dollars of budget. Uh, and to, today, those of you that work with like Lighthouse and Charles Worthington, um, they have like actual responsibility and took over all of VA.gov, which is pretty cool. And all of that started with a paperclip. So look for your paperclip. It was consolidating thousand, over a thousand websites into a single one, going from effectively being a VA-centric website and a VA-centric organization to being more veteran-centric and really putting veteran needs. Uh, and I love the story of starting with a little flanker project, you know, this little innovation thing that people let Marina do in the corner, uh, partly because VA.gov was so complicated and had so much uh, uh, challenges, but also because it let her move faster, prove a better way of working, and then ultimately uh, under her successor, kind of that reverse merger that, that took over uh, VA.gov and now provides a, a better experience for, for all veterans. Uh, find the doers is another tactic we talk about. This was actually a tactic. We had a, a whiteboard in the White House with a bunch of tactics. Uh, we talk about them in, our, in the book. And find the doers is fundamentally, uh, in any organization, there's a lot of talkers, right? And I was actually a professional talker. I was. I was middle management in a lesser policy council inside the presidency. Um, if you wanted uh, something to really get done, you had to make it the National Security Council job or make it the idea of OMB. The Office of Science and Technology Policy, where the CTO's office was, wasn't exactly known for its juice, right? Um, but if you wanted to be effective uh, inside of the presidency, inside of the White House, you really had to find the people who were doing the important work inside of the agencies, right? And that, that wasn't always, and it usually wasn't the, the uh, secretary, the administrator, the assistant secretary, et cetera. It was the actual doers. Um, and finding them, understanding them, and building authentic uh, trust and reciprocity and just building a real relationship with them was a way to get real stuff done. Uh, because, uh, administrations get into this point of view where like, hey, we're gonna publish this big policy, all these executive orders, and executive orders are not self-executing. Uh, take it from me as someone who's had the Department of Defense slow walk or ignore executive orders that I help write. Um, I have a pretty good idea that you have to find the doers who are, who, who are doing great work, amplify their work, codify their work, and celebrate it. So strangling the mainframe. Who is familiar with this concept? Yeah. Uh, so Martin Fowler created it. It is actually not about strangling human beings to murder them. It is about murdering fig trees, just because some people find it a violent analogy. It's only fig trees that are hurt in the, in the process. Uh, and so my uh, company, my crisis engineering firm, our number one, two, and three source of business is people that are trying to replace their mainframe and failing because everybody's in some sort of 10-year digital modernization, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and they, it never fully works, because they're always trying to do a big bang 10-year. They're going to understand every last nuance of the mainframe, and they're going to capture them in Excel spreadsheets very carefully, and then they're going to put them in statements of work very carefully, and then magic. Um, and so what does work, though, is strangling the mainframe, which is taking off one piece at a time. Uh, my preferred analogy here is not that Martin's fig tree, sorry, Martin, is uh, actually Harry Potter. If anybody has not seen Harry Potter to the end, I'm about to give you a very big spoiler, so cover your ears. <laughs> so what do they do in Harry Potter? Voldemort is the enemy. Voldemort is the mainframe. They are trying to replace Voldemort, rip and replace. For six and a half books, they go right at him with your 10-year legacy Big Bang waterfall uh, mainframe modernization project. In the course of that, there's billions of pounds of muggle property damage, most of Harry's family dies, and Voldemort is stronger than ever. What actually works? 
is finding Voldemort's horcruxes. You take just a little like snake here and a little tiara there, and then at the end, Voldemort's this like weird little alien thing, and you can just bop him. Uh, so try looking at whatever big project you were doing, and what are the discrete pieces that you can take off it? It was absolutely our plan for taking a reverse merging, I like that term, uh, va.gov, where we couldn't go at it because it was too big and people would just stop us. They wouldn't even let us to meetings, let alone like deploy code to it. And to get to deploy code to va.gov at the time, you had to go through the change control board, which met quarterly. Um, and so instead, we, we did the GI Bill comparison tool, right? So the first thing that we put on our new website was the GI Bill comparison tool, because they already liked us and they trusted us and there was no PII and there was no account. And then they had a friend at VBA that was the, at the time, the Office of Economic Opportunity. And they had a presidential mandate to put some uh, employment resources for veterans online. And we paired up with them and we put it online. And in the course of that, we saved VA $27 million in duplicative contracts that I then got some of the cost savings for. So now I went from having $2,999 to like $7 million, which is a lot more money. Uh, and then we did it business line by business line such that you can do almost everything on VA.gov today. Uh, and that's only over a 10 year time frame. And the VA has 83 different benefit lines. Um, we also saw a lot of success with this. Um, usually my clients are under NDA, but one that named us publicly was Governor Newsom during the height of the pandemic when California was facing an unemployment claims backlog that they estimate would take 48 years to work down, which is a really long time. Um, we use the strangler pattern to get that down to 60 days and they, they completely worked through the backlog. And that was really looking at like, what are the it's Pareto principle? What are the one or two main pain points? One of them being 99% of the calls, assuming you could even answer them, were people trying to check their claim status, right? And we pulled a CSV off the mainframe once a night, put it on a cloud computing based page that could take people compulsively refreshing all day because that's their behavior when you're desperate and you're trying to get a claim status. Uh, and, and not have a login. And we just found a very simple way to get that up in about a week. Um, and that plus uh, some adoption of NIST standards around identity verification meant that we knocked 48 years down to two months. Meanwhile, they had, they had been on year 11 of their mainframe modernization project. So finding ways to strangle the mainframe and do piece by piece is the way I have, the only way, frankly, that I've seen successful. And I, I think that surely resonates with this crowd. So bureaucracy hacking is a team sport. I think we can all appreciate that. Uh, one of the sayings we had was cultivate the crass. Uh, now, crass is a, a term in Kurt Vonnegut's uh, book, Cat's Cradle. He talks about God putting uh, people on earth for you to find and band together. We have a more secular version of it. Uh, so our definition of a crass is really those people inside and outside of your organization who you can band together uh, to make impact. Um, and so one of our, our colleagues, Jake Brewer, uh, he was tragically killed uh, in a bike race uh, when he was at the White House, uh, and he had this sticker of, of cultivate the crass, and it's something that has always uh, stuck with us. Um, and I, there's, there's two kind of fun, fun stories here. One is the Grilled Cheese Club, Marina. Yeah, uh, yeah so at VA, we called our crass the Grilled Cheese Club. We would get together, definitely not use George Foreman grills to make grilled cheese because that would violate fire codes, and definitely not drink red wine out of Dick's cups because that is not an appropriate thing to do at work. Uh, and we would invite anybody, janitorial staff, legal, HR, procurement, anybody that was even vaguely interested in what we were doing to come to our grilled cheese club. We would give demos, and we would talk about what we're up to next and ask for advice. And it very often, somebody would be like, oh, you know, there's this bucket of money that someone can't spend. You should go talk to them about seeing if you can pair up or like make sure you put that privacy statement on there because when Helen sees this, if that privacy statement isn't exact, she's going to like tie you up in all this, whatever. Uh, not only did that help give us a lot of input from different people uh, around the organization, but um, it also created more advocates for us because the laws of physics meant myself and my teammates could only be in so many places at so many times. And a natural course of when you're trying something new or innovative is people will be like, well, Marina was skipping the entire ATO process. She's not even filling out that blah, blah, blah. And someone would be like, actually, I saw her on Friday at Grilled Cheese Club, and she, was, she had an ATO tracker. She is going through the process. And that kind of advocacy really, really helped um, to keep us uh, you know, on track and not from getting too, too sideswiped. One of the things about a crass is it, it really ought to be from different functions, different parts of an organization. It's, if you're a bunch of developers and you're hanging with only developers, 
uh, you're really not appreciating HR and legal and, and all of those other things. And, and so I think in that example, Marina was really able to, to find informal ways to, to kind of communicate information and build those kinds of relationships. Uh, the other fun, fun story is the security guards. Yeah, so I mentioned how, like, as we were building Vets.gov at the time, the next tranche was the employment team. And they were get to be able to recoup about $27 million of duplicative contracts. But to do that, um, I was going to have to move 1,000 HTML articles off the existing websites and onto our new platform. And that doesn't sound super hard, but I was alone. And I had two weeks, and I did not, I was like, there's no way I can do this in time. I'm, how am I going to get you know, $7 million of recoup cost if I can't move these 1,000 pages? And I was telling this to Simon, the security guard on the 12th floor, when it occurred to me that Simon had a computer and a little bit of time on his hands. And I said, hey, Simon, how would you like to learn HTML? And he was like, ooh, yes, I would be very interested in that. I will come at lunch. And he came at lunch, and he came with the security guards from the other 11 floors. And we had like an HTML crash course. I mean, you, didn't, you just needed little stuff, right? You were moving text over. Um, and my gosh, you'd go to every floor, and they were still doing their security job, but you'd see them like typing and moving the articles. I beat the deadline, got $7 million, which again, I had $3,000 before that, so holy shit. Um, and all of them then quit the VA for IT jobs. So uh, that is certainly my favorite Karas story, because who would have thought that the way that the chief technology officer of the largest civilian agency gets her first budget is through 12 security guards, but that's, that's how it happened. Uh, next tactic is looking between the silos. This is my absolute favorite out of all 56. It's one that I use constantly. Um, I have about a million stories, but I will tell one from the VA fairly quickly. And the goal of looking between the silos is to follow an actual process from start to finish, and I mean a real process, a real ATO application, a real approval, a real claim. Um, and I know, you know Brian has some amazing stories of doing this for, uh, to get to continuous ATO, and that's another, to me, example of looking between the silos. Because we all know silos, right? They're like defended. It's almost like they've got sentry guards posted outside that are there to defend against change or people coming to look in. But the handoffs between the steps, between the departments, often nobody's looking there at all. And they're often making a change there can be nearly effortless sometimes because nobody is paying attention and nobody is defending it. Um, the craziest story I had around this when I was flying around the country um, following the VA disability claims process, which at the time took four and a half years on average to work down. Um, and I would follow it and veteran with their permission like to their medical exam and the doctor would write this like eight page, very detailed medical report. And I asked that doctor what he thought happened next or he or she and they said, oh, I expect another more experienced, even better doctor will read my very detailed report and they will make a nuanced, complicated decision about how disabled this veteran actually is. Then I actually went to what the next step in the process was. And uh, there is a person who has no medical training of any kind whatsoever who is looking at a uh, calculator made out of Visual Basic in the 1990s that asked them to input two numbers. Those two numbers are basically never in the eight-page medical report. And that means that that person then sends the veteran back for an additional exam uh, where there's another eight-page essay and it just kept looping and looping. I brought these two teams together in one place and I had them just demonstrate their steps to one another. And people lost their freaking minds. Uh, and what that drove is like those doctors were never going to write another eight page essay again because they saw it was not going anywhere and only that causing harm later. And we ran a really successful pilot where we actually gave that visual basic calculator to the doctor um, and were able to process claims in the same day in our pilot in Salt Lake. Um, for different reasons that didn't end up, the VA is still not using that, but it worked. If anybody is ever working on this now, it worked and it had an ATO. Okay, make the bureaucracy work for you. Um, I tell the story, we tell the story in the book uh, about Rohan Pavluri, who's one of my students. Uh, he was at uh, Harvard College. Uh, and so uh, he uh, comes to office hours. Uh, I'm an adjunct at the Kennedy School there, but I have a few precocious college students. He knocks on the door and he says, uh, uh, hey, Professor Sinai, which I always get a kick out of, and I'm like looking around, and they're like, hey, Professor Sinai, uh, I'm here for office hours. Uh, my parents are here because it is parents weekend. Uh, can they just like wait outside? And I was like, your parents are not waiting outside. Like, come on in, you know? And so we sat down and we were you know, having chit chat. It was, it was parents weekend. And suddenly Mrs. Pavlori kind of interrupts and she's like, professor, my son cannot drop out of Harvard. Please tell him to stay. 
Um, and he had been working on a social impact startup, a nonprofit startup uh, called Upsolve to help low income Americans with bankruptcy. Bankruptcy is actually complicated. Uh, it's actually kind of costly to file. And so a lot of low, Americans, uh, low income Americans are trapped in bankruptcy, often due to medical debt and, and other unforeseen circumstances. He was really passionate about this idea and was thinking about dropping out of college and maybe he had blamed me or his mother had, had assumed that it, I was encouraging such behavior. Uh, and I assured her, of course, he should continue with his studies. Um, and he ended up using the bureaucracy, using the organization of Harvard, Harvard College, Harvard University, Harvard Kennedy School, reorganized his studies, did independent studies, and every class he took, every resource that he went after and he won various awards was funneled into this nonprofit. So this, this nonprofit, Upsolve, which uh, he was the executive director and co-founder of, has helped extinguish uh, over $700 million of uh, debt from low-income Americans, a lot of it uh, medical debt. And it's a great example of how Rohan was able to use the bureaucracy of a large academic institution that if you figure out the authorities, if you figure out the ways that it work, and you build authentic relationships with the people that work there, including lowly adjuncts, you're able to find ways to make the bureaucracy work for you. So I really liked Adam's talk yesterday because he said we have to assume that we're going to have middle managers and how can we leverage them in, in new ways. Yeah, great. Well, those are just some stories. We'd love to talk to you more and please come to the book signing. If you happen to already have our book, we have stickers so you can take home and stick into your book, uh, Us and the Corporate Rebels. So thanks so much. Thank you.